Okay, I just started this video and then it uh, cut off on me, so hopefully this works. Um, okay, so um, what I like to do before I even get started is I have a hard time seeing that the X squared is at the end. Um, so it helps my brain to rearrange them in descending order, starting with your largest exponent and then moving to your next and your next. That helps my brain. If you can see it without it, then definitely don't take your don't take the time to rearrange it if that makes sense to you. Um, so just remember that you always take the sign in front of the term. So this is a negative x squared. This is your positive x. And this constant, because it doesn't have a sign in front of it, we know that it's positive. It's kind of like an invisible positive sign. Um, so I'm gonna rearrange this to y equals negative x squared plus x plus six. This helps my brain see it a little bit better. Um, and now, if we're, we are in standard form, vertex form has the brackets, before you get to see the squared. So um, we're gonna label our A, B's and C's. So just remember that if there's no number in front, it's the invisible number ones. And we know that A, B and C, so A is the coefficient on the X squared. So A is negative one. Oh, maybe that's a bad place to write it. Let me write it somewhere else. I'll write it underneath. Uh, a is negative 1, B is positive 1, and C is my constant term, which is 6. So it always helps me rearrange it in order from highest exponent down to my constant. Helps my brain think about it a little bit better. So when I'm doing anything with quad quadratics, especially graphing, what I'm going to do is I'm always going to find my vertex first. Whether I'm in vertex form or whether I'm in standard form, I will find my vertex first. So for me, I find that using, I always do that first, um, I find using the secret formula, and I call it the secret formula because it's not on my students' cheat sheets. Oh, they don't get cheat sheets. It's not on their formula sheet. Um, it's not anywhere, so they have to commit that to memory. So we in my class, we call it the secret formula. Um, so we practice remembering it, uh, and you'll use that even into grade 12. So. It's worth taking a minute. So now we're gonna fill in our formula here. So we know B is a positive one. So we are going to, it's a negative in the formula. So it will be X is equal to negative one over two times, oops, I forgot my negative sign. I said it, but I didn't put it in. So X is equal to negative one over negative two. Now in math, if there are two formulas, or sorry, two negative signs, we always write it as a positive. It's kind of like grammar in English. You want to, you're not wrong leaving it like this, but it's more mathematically, grammatically correct to write it as a positive. Now, in my class, um, I encourage my students to use fractions. Uh, the more you practice them, the more comfortable you'll get with them. Um, but it's really up to you. If you want to switch this to a decimal, if you want to use 0 0.5, that's okay too. So what the secret formula just found, that is your x coordinate of the vertex. That's your x coordinate of the vertex. So now we just need to find the y coordinate of the vertex. So um, I'm going to go up to here and I'm going to take this one half and I'm going to substitute it in to the original equation. So y is equal to negative bracket one half squared plus one half plus six. So notice that my negative is outside the bracket. It's your x that's being squared and then you multiply by that negative one. Your coefficient is negative one so we square first and then we multiply by negative one. So we have our negative outside, we square the top and we square the bottom. One times one is one, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 half, plus 6. Uh, so this will be negative 1 quarter, plus 1 half, plus 6. Okay, so with fractions, we know that we need common denominators in order to add or subtract them. So if I look at this, 4 is my common denominator. So I can just leave that 1 as 1 quarter. 
So if I need to change the two into a four, I'm gonna multiply by two, but whatever I do to the bottom, I have to do to the top. So one times two is two, two times two is four. And I apologize if you're really good at converting fractions. I know that sometimes in my class, we just need a refresher. Um, and students are really hesitant. They like to go to decimals, um, but I like to do it as fractions. So bear with me, if you are doing it as decimals, we'll get the exact same answer. So six is really six over one, and that needs to change to a four. So I'm gonna times by four, whatever I do to the bottom, I have to do to the top. So I'm gonna have 24 over four. So now I can go ahead and just malt, or sorry, I can go ahead and combine all these terms. So negative one plus two is a positive one. Positive one plus 24 is 25 over four. And if I do the math with that, that's gonna be six and one quarter. And if you're doing decimals, that would be 6.25. Oh, that's an ugly vertex. That is an ugly vertex. So my vertex is 0 0.5 and 6.25. All right, well, like I said, a little bit ugly, but not the end of the world. Once you find your vertex, once you've found your vertex, we're gonna, it's gonna give you some information right away. This, is the x-coordinate of the vertex, but it's also related to your axis of symmetry. And so I know that that was later in the list, but we're gonna do that right away. So your axis of symmetry, the equation of the axis of, of the symmetry always starts with x and is equal to whatever the x-coordinate is of your vertex. And there we go. Okay, I think that was that was the third thing we were supposed to find. We were supposed to find vertex first, and then we were supposed to do our X and Y intercepts. Um, I'm not sure if you guys did your factoring yet. If you have, you guys are rock stars. We definitely haven't got there yet. Um, so I'm not 100% sure how you want me to show you that, but I will show you a couple different ways. Okay, it also tells you, do I have a different color here? I do. This also tells you your value of your max or minimum of a graph. If your graph opens down, you have a maximum value. This is the max value. Of your parabola parabola. If I say it like that, then I know how to spell it. Um, so that, it, so your vertex tells you a bunch of things. And in my class, when we find our vertex, we get those two things done and out of the way. Your question doesn't ask you about max or min. So don't worry about it, especially if that's not something you've covered. I just know that I like to focus on it as well. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip my page for a second because I'm running out of room. So we know the vertex is at 0 0.5 and 6.25, we just found that. We know our axis of symmetry, the equation of our axis of symmetry is x equals 0 0.5. Uh, now it's on the x and y intercepts. Um, so I always start with my, let me start over here, y intercept. This one's the easiest to find, especially if you're in standard form. So let me write my equation because I lost it on the other page. X squared plus X plus six. We know, and if you're not familiar where your X intercept is, if I have a parabola, or sorry, your Y intercept, that's where it's gonna cross the Y axis. Your X intercepts are gonna be where the graph crosses the X axis. So back and forth kind of thing. But if we're looking at our Y intercept right here, we always know that our x value will be zero and our job is to find that y. So super easy way to do it. X is equal to zero. I'm gonna sub that information into my formula. And it's gonna be six. So I know that my y intercept is six. And if you are in standard form, your quadratic is in standard form, it's always gonna be your constant. It's always gonna be your constant. Um, 
but if you're in vertex form, that number on the end is not your y-intercept, it's your y-coordinate to your vertex. Okay, so let's talk about our x-intercepts. Now, if you guys have been factoring already, which I'm super impressed if you have, same sort of thing, these, we don't know what the x value is, but we know the y value is zero. So we know that y is zero, so we are going to um, put that in to the equation. Okay, so because I have a quadratic, I am going to factor. So because this is a negative one up front, um, you we call this complex factoring. I'm not sure if you guys do that. Let me grab my red pen. I'm gonna put my... And so we times A by C. And we're looking for the factors of negative six that add up to one. So that would be a positive three and a negative two. And if you haven't done this yet, then ignore this part of the video. It's not important. Um, so all we're doing is we're gonna write this middle term differently. We keep the front term, so negative x squared. And then I'm gonna have plus three x minus two x plus six. Now, these two terms, if you were to combine them, go right back to here. So we haven't changed the value, we've just changed the way it looks. So now I'm gonna look at these front two terms and I am gonna common factor out um, something. I'm gonna common factor out a letter or a number or maybe both. In this case, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna common factor out a negative one and an x. So I'm gonna take a negative one x out and if I were to divide these terms by negative one x, negative one x, I would get x minus three. That's what's left over. And you would have done common factoring in your grade 10 course. So if you wanna think way back to there. So now I'm gonna look at these back two terms and what's common, I'm gonna take out a negative two this time. So negative two comes out and if I divide this term by negative two, I'm left with x. And if I divide this term by negative two, I'm left with a negative three. I know I've done my factoring right. If these two things in the binomial are the same, oops, forgot my zero there. So I'm gonna have x minus three as one. And if I cover that over what's left, I have negative one x minus two. All right, so you're like, okay, what does that mean? I don't know what to do with that. You're gonna set each factor equal to zero. So x minus three equals zero and negative one x minus two equals zero. And we're just gonna solve for x. So add three to both sides. So x is equal to three. Um, I'm gonna have a negative one x. I'm gonna add two to both sides equals a positive two. This one I have to do another step. I gotta divide by negative one divide by negative one, so x is equal to negative two. All right, well, I'm looking at these and I'm guessing that you probably haven't got to factoring to solve for them yet, so I want you to ignore everything I just told you. Um, this is okay to do, and you've probably done that in your class. So let's look at using a table of values to go ahead and graph. Oh, by the way, we have found our x-intercepts and our y-intercepts, but I think we'll do it using graphing. So I always say a table of values never leads you wrong. Um, a table of values never leads you wrong. So when I create a table of values for my parabola, I always start with my vertex in the middle. And the reason why I do that is because it helps me visually see that I need to pick values less, less than uh, ne uh, 0.5 and greater than 0.5. So I always drop that right in the middle of the table. So maybe I'll do zero, negative one, negative two. And on this side, I'll do one, two, and three. All right, so now we're gonna substitute these x values into the equation. So it might get a little messy with my math because I'm gonna show you every one. So I'm gonna start at the top of my table at negative two. So y equals negative, negative two squared, plus negative two, 
plus six. I find a lot of students um, mix it up. They put the negative inside as well and it gets a little confusing. So negative two squared is a positive four times by a negative one is a negative four minus two, I can write it like that, plus six. So negative four minus two plus six, that gives me zero. So I'm gonna put that in my table there. And like I said, it's gonna get a little messy because I'm gonna show you every one that I'm doing. Now, some, like you might go right to your calculator and there is no shame in that game. Um, and you can input this into your calculator. Like I have a pretty fancy calculator and I can put all of this in, in one step into my calculator. Most scientific calculators I can. Um, so what did I have a negative two squared? And then we had plus negative two. So you see I'm using all those brackets. So make sure that you're using your negative button on the calculator. Make sure you're using your bracket buttons. And any scientific calculator will have them. You don't have to have as fancy one as I do. And that gives me a value of zero, which we just found to be true by doing it by hand. So it's really what you prefer to do. And I'm not sure if your teacher allows you to have a calculator. Um, maybe they do, maybe they don't, I don't know. Uh, negative one minus negative one plus six is a positive four. If I put zero in for x, we've already done that math right here above it. So we're gonna work smarter, not harder. So we're just gonna fill that in. And so now we're putting one in. So y equals negative one squared plus one plus six. So y equals negative one plus one plus six. Oh, look at that. Things are turning. It's my exciting part. Um, we notice how we're growing, we're growing, we're growing, we hit to a max point, and then we go down and down and down. And if these are the same distance away from the vertex, I anticipate that my two is gonna have a value of four, but I don't trust my math yet. So I'm, well, I do trust my math, but you shouldn't trust my math because we need to check it. Okay, so let's see what we have here. We have negative four plus two plus six. So negative four plus two is negative two, negative two plus six, y equals four, just like I thought it was gonna be. Um, so what I always tell my students about parabolas is the reason why they're beautiful is because they have symmetry. If you're the same distance away, we're half away here, we're at six. Half away to the right, we're at six. We're one and a half away, we're at four. One and a half away, we're also at four. So that's the symmetry, the beauty of it. Um, that's just what I like to talk about in my math class. So my last one here, I'm substituting three in. So remember the three gets squared to nine, nine times negative one is negative nine. So negative nine plus three is negative six, negative six plus six is zero. And I did anticipate that it should be that. So I'm guessing that your teacher didn't expect you to do this factoring. They expected you to do um, the graphing because the x-intercepts are nice that you would just see them. Okay, I don't wanna lose that table of values because it's gonna really help me when I graph. All right, I'm gonna keep that right there beside me. And I will send pictures of all these finished sheets uh, just so you have all my work and everything. All right. Yes, I do keep rulers and graphing calculators at home. You never know when you're going to have to do math. Um, I'm just going to tell you as a math teacher, I would expect that all your graphs are going to be drawn with rulers and on graph paper. Um, that's the expectation. If you're in pre-cal, this is, uh, we're really accurate. We get super duper precise. So that's just me and my PSA about making sure you have everything perfect. Maybe not perfect. Nobody's ever perfect. Okay, I'm going to skip every one and I don't know what I was doing there. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, tw
two, three, four, five, and then I'm going to be negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. I obviously didn't draw my axes uh, symmetrical, so I'll just add that in there. Um, I think I'm going to go up by ones on my y-axis. Remember that these are called increments and they need to be labeled. Um, it's bad oh bad if you don't label them. Makes teachers sad. And the more, the more precise you are with your graphs, I, I think you get a better picture of what you're doing. Okay, so here's my table of values still here. Um, I always like to start with my vertex. So half and 6.25, so I'm just a little bit above the six there. Ooh, my pen's really inky all of a sudden. And then at one, I'm at six. And I have no idea why I like to do my positive side first, but that's just who I am as a person. And then on the other side at zero, I'm at six. At negative one, I'm at four. And at negative two, I'm at zero. So what you should see is a nice symmetrical, there's my axis of symmetry. It draws right through here. I don't know if your, pro, or your teacher expects you to draw it on the graph. Sometimes we'll ask for that because we're crazy. Now with your points, you want to connect them with a nice smooth curve. That's probably the best I've done in a long time. Okay, we put arrows on the ends to show that it goes on forever. And the axis of symmetry, like it lays right here. And what it is, it's the mirror. If I were to fold along that line, both sides of the graph would come up and they'd be exactly the same on either side. They'd match perfectly. Um, and in pre-cal, we like to have always two points labeled on any graph. And you're like, why are you picking those points? Uh, one, because they're nice and far away from each other. I'm not gonna cluster my stuff. It really doesn't matter what two you label. So we know our y intercept is at y equals six. Now, I'm not sure if your teacher likes to see it as a coordinate pair. Some people do. Your x intercepts are at x equals negative two and positive three. Now, some teachers don't like to see it like that. They like to see the actual coordinate pairs and that is okay. We all like to do things a little bit different. So there's your x and y intercepts. I'm guessing your teacher wanted you to graph it and then see them. And now the last thing we have to do is domain and range. So domain. And this again comes back from that grade 10 and we really struggled with a grade 10, but I promise you the more you look at it, the easier it's gonna get, the more you practice. I swear it does get easier. So domain, we're saying how far left and how far right do we go? And because this graph continues on out, 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 out forever and ever, because that's why we have arrows on it, we know that we're gonna get wide, 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 wide as we go off the graph here. So our domain is going to be round bracket negative infinity, comma, positive infinity round bracket. Now, what that means is that it doesn't, in the round bracket means it doesn't include either of these points. Um, some teachers want to see it in set notation. This is called interval notation. If you want to see it in set notation, it's actually just X, E, R. X is an element of all real numbers. It just means, hey, it's everything. And now when we do the range, we're talking about how low the graph goes to how high the graph goes. Now we, I just dropped my ruler. Uh, how low it goes, it goes off the graph real low because those arrows keep going. So we would say negative infinity. But there is a top part of the graph. It doesn't go past that. And when I talked a little about it, that on the other page, the top is your highest point, which in this case is your vertex. So this is your 6.25. Now that point is on the graph, so we use a square bracket to include it. If you want to see it in set notation, we do a fancy bracket. We say that y is less than or equal to 
6.25, where y, let me, that's probably not, I'm gonna put a comma, where y is an element of the real numbers, and we finish with a fancy bracket. I would say most of my students like interval notation way better than set notation. And I don't force them to do it in either form, like they can have their choice, but they do need to know how to read this. Um, they might not use it, but they need to know how to read it. Okay, so I think I've answered all the parts to it. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. I will send pictures to go along. Thank you.